All right, everybody, welcome for, welcome for joining tonight, um, both for the people that are in the room and for those that are, that are joining live. My name is Carl Dobman, and I'm the Dean of the College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Technological University. The College of Architecture and Design focuses on design informed by technology and based in practice. The lecture series is a great opportunity to bring in amazing practi practitioners to discuss what and why they do what they do. Tonight is a perfect example with Catherine Cha, joining us to share the work from her practice, Desai De Cha Architecture. Catherine's a founding principal of Desai Cha Architecture. Since 1996, she and her partner and husband, um, Desai, have established the firm's reputation for authentic design creating inspiring environments expresses of, expressive of light, materials, and spaces that foster collaboration. Desai Cha's portfolio includes cultural, residential, and commercial projects, as well as commissions for product design and collaborations with artists. Desai Cha's projects have been published extensively and received numerous accolades, including numerous AIA, and American Architecture Awards, Interior Design, Best of the Year Awards, Good Design Awards, and an AIA Institute Honor Award. Architect Magazine ranked Desai Cha Architecture number 19th in the nation for design. I think it was a couple of years ago that there was an incredible house that was published that caught a number of us by surprise because it was called the Michigan Lake House. Where, where is this house? How did this happen? Who is this? Where did this come from? Uh, some of you were looking at it in studio today as we were walking around. It's a really beautiful project. Catherine will show that tonight among other projects. Um, and maybe a slight plug for, um, I saw Catherine present the project at the AIA, AIA design retreat. Uh, which will happen in the fall. So if students are interested in attending that, it's a great opportunity. It happens up north at a camp, and there's an amazing opportunity to interact with and network with professionals that are there and see design projects. Um, Catherine grew up in New York State and Belgium. She earned her Master of Architecture degree from MIT and received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Amherst College. Prior to founding Desai Cha Architecture, she worked for Maya Lin on numerous art and architecture commissions, one of which was in Michigan at the U of M campus. So if anybody's seen that project or visited that project, um, she was involved in that. Um, she's also been a faculty member in the architecture department at Parsons, the new school of design. So let's give Catherine a warm welcome to Lawrence Technological University. Thank you. Oh, let me grab the uh, mic from you. Uh, this one. Oh, that's, you that one. oh, this yep. is Marie. Okay, yep. great. Okay, all set. Thank you so much, Carl. It's really great to be here. Um, it's actually an honor to be here. I think your mission here of practice as well as theory, combining those two really is, is something that I respect tremendously. It's an important part of what we do in our practice. Uh, so I think it's great that you're really taking that to heart and pushing that through your education. So I'm gonna take you through some of our projects, but just to give you a little bit of insight into our office, uh, we are a small boutique design firm. We're a group of six people uh, working very hard in all facets of architecture, interior design, landscape design, product design, and uh, we engage very closely with all of our clients. We work with a great team of consultants as well, so we can take on much larger projects by growing the group, uh, by bringing on consultants. Um, so I think at any scale where you're doing the work, it's for us important to be committed uh, to the design aspect, but also think carefully about function. Um, so I'm gonna take you through some projects and then afterwards we can have a chat. So this first two projects that I'm going to show you are actually projects that are sort of in the works. This is a project in Bangalore, India. Uh, it is a large 12-story um, residential tower. Um, Bangalore has a lot of different architecture that's evolved over time. It's a booming city. It's probably one of the fastest growing cities in India. Uh, so this example is a building in Bangalore, and you'll notice that the tops of the buildings are sort of these decorated ornamental pieces. Um, that sort of caught our eye, and we thought about that in terms of a modern interpretation, how to think about the top of a building as a destination. 
We also looked at Indian step wells and other forms of traditional Indian architecture for inspiration for this project. Uh, jollies, which are hand carved stone elements um, traditionally used to screen out the uh, really intense sun rays that happen uh, in places like India and the subcontinent. Uh, we looked at these jolly pieces as ways of screening uh, light and filtering light into the interior spaces. This is a traditional temple in India. So in plan, we were also looking at how this building could be ventilated, um, thinking about sustainability from a practical point of view. So natural ventilation, greening the inside as well as the balcony spaces on each floor. So this is a rendering of the project. It's under construction right now. Uh, it has green elements across the facade. And at the top, there's sort of a special amenity moment for the residents. So this is the top of the building. So the destination moment, uh, which is captured with a lap pool, uh, a yoga area, places for retreat and lounging and relaxing. And then as you move down the building, we have a detail on the facade which came from that study of the step wells, this sort of faceted um, uh, way of bringing the light in to the balcony spaces. So we studied that as well, looking at different scales and proportions for those details. Uh, because for us, what's important is not only a building from far away and how that looks as a, maybe an iconic object, but as you get closer and closer, those layers of detail actually need to expose themselves and reveal themselves. And so as you get closer, even down to finally the level of door now becomes very important. And this is one of the interiors looking at those screen-like elements, which allow this really intense light from the outside to filter in. This is another project that we're working on. It's for a liberal arts college. Uh, it's their art museum, which has been sort of, it's gone through a lot of Band-Aid moments, and now it needs a refresh. So we've been studying it as a master plan, looking at all the different activities that currently happen in, the, in this museum space uh, for this liberal arts college. And then also looking at new uses that could happen, thinking about how art has transformed over the many years. And a place like a museum is no longer a bunker for storing art. It's now actually a place that can become an art center and enliven and become part of the heart of the campus. So we looked at how to add space, renovate the existing galleries. So this is a diagram just showing very simply how one can take an existing building and retrofit it instead of knocking it down completely and then looking at how to connect the two sides of the campus, the main quad and a science quad, through the building. We're actually pushing a stairwell through the building and then out the backside to get views, light, and circulation through. So these are just some quick studies that we've done. So you know, what we try to do is really use these renderings as a way to study movement, light, space, volume, massing. So these are actually works in progress for us. and studying connections of light and volume through, through the spaces. So now I'll take you through some of our built work. Um, we do a range of projects. Some are sort of quirky and unusual and unexpected. Uh, this was a collaboration with an artist. He came to us and said that he had a project in Singapore and he needed to collaborate with somebody who could help him realize the physical uh, experience so his work is primarily in the realm of the conceptual. He does a lot of participatory art. His name is Li Ming Wei. He's a Taiwanese-born American artist. So we took the central three-story atrium of this museum in Singapore, it's the Peronican Museum, and created a large vessel in it using very simple elements, steel hoops, uh, rope, and resin uh, panels. So the goal of this project was really surrounded about the act of releasing and letting go of your baggage. So this artist had this idea for the Peronican Museum, which is a museum for the Peronican people. Um, it's a particular culture in Singapore where they have gathered a lot of their artifacts into this museum. But frankly, a lot of those artifacts are not really museum worthy. So the idea was to take uh, replicas of some of these artifacts, recreate them, and have people purchase for a small amount of money a piece and they could go up to the top balcony and toss it into a void. So as they toss it into the void, our job was to not only capture that act of tossing, but also to protect people from getting hurt when the thing falls to the ground and all the shards fly all over the place. So there was a practical component to this, but we tried to do it in a way that was really con conceptual. So we tried to capture the light and draw the light down and then capture the object and the aggregation of the object down below. 
So when you come up to the top of the museum with your piece, you step onto a platform, you get to the edge of a railing, and then you basically toss your piece into this void. The light from above follows the strands of the ropes going down through. And as the piece moves down, it comes into a resin, frosted resin enclosure. That enclosure is really meant to caption all these pieces so that they aggregate over the course of the six months when this um, installation was up. So at the end of the installation, all of these pieces create this sort of glowing mound on the inside. Some of them even spill out. And this was a chance for people in Singapore, which is a place that has very, very strict rules. So if you throw gum on the ground or if you toss a piece of trash on the sidewalk, you can get arrested for that. So people are not used to this kind of sort of aberrant behavior, but it was a chance for them to really experience this moment of release. Another project that we did in Asia was a landscape project. So every now and then we're involved in, in landscape architecture. This was a 10,000 square foot courtyard in the women's dormitory at Tonghai University. So this is what the courtyard looked like before. It was sort of a place where students might put a couple of potted plants out there, um, but really an unused sort of leftover space. So we took it and we tried to make it into a place for contemplation and a place for gathering and meeting. Um, what I think is important about college campuses is that people can find places to connect with each other. So we stitched together these pathways through the courtyard so people would start moving into the center of the space. We thought about landscape as grass and trees. Uh, the trees are eight uh, flowering uh, cherry trees that really add a lot of color and punch into the space uh, during the month of February. At other times, those trees provide shade. So the stitching of these pathways also turns into benches and seating, and then water elements allow uh, the sound of the water to kind of create an, an evocative feel in the space. Um, there's actually a poem also that's inscribed um, in a slab. So the water passes over this poem and then drops into um, this large cistern with these fountain elements. So just using very simple materials, gravel, grass, uh, two different kinds of stone, uh, wood for the benches, we were able to create and transform this environment. So bringing us back to our, my hometown, where my office is located, which is New York City, um, we were hired by a company called Quartz, <clears throat> which is a digital media company. Uh, their prompt is qz.com if you want to go and check them out on the internet. Uh, they basically um, attack media from a couple of vantage points. So they think about the intersection between politics, fashion, culture, um, finance, and media. And they bring it all together with these really wonderful, really insightful articles. Um, they came to us because they were essentially a startup, 30 people, and all of a sudden they grew, and now there's 175 people and what to do. So what happens with these startups, we work with a lot of tech startups, um, they often start almost like an expansion of their dorm room from college. So when they were 30 people, they were sort of shoved into this small space, working really intensely. But at 175 people, you have to really identify the company, the brand, the culture. And we wanted to give them a, a strong identity for themselves and also allow them to have interaction and communication and community within this group. When they were a group of 30, they really felt that they were this tight-knit group. At 175, you start to get silos, you start to get people who work independently and may not talk to the rest of the group. So it was really important to find pathways. So we looked at these old Polynesian maps, which are a series of reeds that are connected with intersections of shells. And these maps are actually used to navigate through the waters in Asia and to be able to get from one island to another, um, avoiding eddies, avoiding uh, rock outcroppings. So it was sort of a, an interesting experiment and exploration to think about these internal navigation systems. And every company has it. So it's really whether you're going to grab it and express it and kind of find a way to, to make it something tangible that people can grab onto as, as part of their identity within the company. So Quartz, actually, we did a series of really intense conversations with them. Um, we must have interviewed 20 different groups within the company. And we did not let the CEOs or the uh, kind of head 
um, administrative, administrative people participate. It was really about the staff and what the staff wanted. So these were the words that came out of those conversations. And essentially what everybody said to us in all of these groups was that they really felt like there was a quartzy vibe in this company. So we really latched onto that and thought about this quirky, quartzy, somewhat nerdy vibe, but they were all about this intellectual curiosity and exploration. So we thought about carefully what it means to work in a place and to meet up in a place. And for this company, it was about this quirky, quartzy zone, places where they could do things that were actually quite personal to the individual, but also shareable with the group. So they talked to us about eating, about drinking, happy hour, about coffee, um, making artisanal coffee together, uh, maker spaces. They talked to you about their love of books, even though they're a digital online, online platform, they actually do use books. Uh, they talked about plants and, and growing things, um, reading and, and display. So we organized the space with a series of moments moments to meet, moments to break away, uh, moments to read books and have coffee, and also a big town hall space where they could gather and do TED Talk type events, um, do uh, sort of spontaneous presentations, have lunch together. So all of these activities actually came out of these conversations with, with the members of the staff. So this courtsy space was an undulating moment that moved through the office and then expanded into some of the perimeter areas. So this is an old loft building, uh, cast iron loft building, really tall ceilings, and we inserted these quartzy moments into the space, but in a way that the staff could actually populate them. So the idea was that the framework or the studs would be exposed and the staff could actually come in and, and populate these, these walls themselves. So the library space is a place, place to meet, a place to exchange books, a place to curate books, so members of the staff actually take ownership in, in participating in this. These spaces are actually also really important meeting spaces for, for real hardcore meetings as well. So they will reserve these spaces to have their sort of intense conversations about an article they're researching or a direction for the, um, the next issue. A maker space, which was an important meeting space. There were a number of people that talked about how when they're thinking about projects that they want to work on, um, they are also using different objects and kind of manipulating them at the same time. And by physically making something while they're talking to people, they can explore ideas in a different way. So this makerspace became a really important hub in the office uh, for, for a lot of the people who work there. The cafe bar area, um, where they actually make a lot of artisanal coffees. We uh, created th these chalkboard moments on the back so uh, people can write various things about the things that they're making there. Um, and places for people to break out, sit and have coffee, have intimate meetings, um, or have a large group session. And then the connection between these courtsy spaces and the actual workhorse of the company, which is the newsroom. So that's where everybody gets a proper desk with their computer. But they want to be able to break out and go to these courtsy spaces to be able to have moments that get them away from their desk. We actually thought that was really important because from just a health and wellness point of view, I think it's really important to make sure people get up and walk around. We're all tied to our computer and trapped to our desk. Um, so getting people to move around was really essential. And this was done on an incredibly tight budget. A lot of the startups we work with have very little money. So we use very simple materials, um, very simple construction. We work with craftspeople locally, and we get it done. Uh, the breakout space along the window is also really important. Um, the newsroom is a busy, bustling place, but right next to it is a beautiful window wall. So we created all of these book cubbies where they can curate their books, um, store their books, share books with other people. And then there are other places to break out. Um, and these actually are movable pieces. So as they set up the office in different correct, uh, configurations, they can actually move these plinths around. And then there's seating area where we do the TED Talks, um, they have lunch, uh, they have big town hall meetings for the office. So bleachers that wrap around the perimeter that are flexible. Um, and also we did a riff on the old construction of this, this cast iron building. There are these big crown moldings that wrap around the exterior of the building. So we, we use that as a piece uh, to create shelving throughout the space. And over time they've 
they've tra all the people who work here, they travel quite a bit um, for the research that they do. They bring back artifacts from places they travel to and they've populated these shelves. So this next project is a house up in Dutchess County, New York, which is upstate New York. Um, we designed this house thinking it was going to be the guest house pavilion. Uh, we actually had two commissions from this client. It's a 360 acre piece of property uh, in rural uh, upstate New York. So the clients, had, they had purchased this Pennsylvania Dutch barn, uh, which had been taken down by a barn company that will take these old barns take them down, store them, preserve them, and then re-erect them on a different site. So our client went through this whole process. I went to the barn, looked at it, got taken down, put into two containers, brought over to the site, and we designed this very large um, home for this client. At the same time, they said, you know, that home is gonna take a long time to build. So why don't we do a guest house first? And then we can live in the guest house, watch the main house go up. So we designed the main house, and then as we were sort of like, at 50% DD, we started to jump to this guest house. So we designed the guest house, got it all ready to build. And after it was built, the client started to live in it and liked it so much uh, that the barn is still in the container. So my caution to you is that as you're designing projects for clients, if you have multiple projects on a particular property, um, be careful about the first one you build because if they like it too much, they might not go ahead with the next one. So this is the site. It's a beautiful pastoral site. It was an old farm property, um, and it also had an airplane hangar on it. It was one of these crop duster uh, runways as well. So there's a big pond on the site, a um, lot of rock outcroppings. So we decided to actually place this house on a rock outcropping. So we had to actually core drill into the rock, pin the foundation to it. We drilled uh, six geothermal wells into the rock as well. Um, so the rock became this, this really integral part of the house. We looked at a lot of art. That's actually one of the inspirations that we, we use a lot in our work. We look at contemporary art um, and we, we think about the way contemporary art engages materials, light, color, texture. So in this case, we were looking at Agnes Martin and Donald Judd. We also looked at uh, Mies van der Rohe and the Farnsworth House. So this was actually an inspiration that came from the client. They really loved this kind of very purist modern architecture, which was really part of my um, education as well. So I was always drawn to these very clean, minimal modern pieces. Um, so as we started to look at the Mies pieces, we said, you know, the idea of an all glass house was kind of resonating uh, in the way we were talking about this project with the client. So basically we thought about you know, what we could do to make a sustainable, um, very modern, full all year round home uh, that, that basically captured some of these elements. So we studied the house. We thought about this core inside the house as being a core for a family of four. So there's uh, two sets of bunk beds in the middle part of the core for the kids. There's a master bedroom, there's a large living room, dining room, and then there's actually an outdoor space which becomes almost a second living room uh, for this house. So in the floor plan, it's a very simple box. It's basically 32 by 72. Um, it has an internal core space and the entire perimeter of the house is glass. We worked with uh, Arup, the engineering firm. They did a fantastic job working with us to achieve a cantilevered roof on this building with the minimal amount of materials. So we have basically four posts in the core, and then out from that, this giant roof um, spans out. What's nice about that is that the glass is essentially a curtain wall. It's not really taking on any load. So we were able to uh, use these really large single or uh, triple pane pieces of glass. Um, the longest one is 22 feet and all of them are 10 foot eight high. We looked at sustainability in this project. For a lot of our residential projects, the clients are not going for LEED certification. Um, a lot of them are not even talking about sustainability as like a, a, prim a primary goal. So we try to bring in sustainability whenever we can. And sometimes we just have to talk to the clients about it from a very practical point of view. So here we talked to the client about geothermal, heating and cooling, radiant floors. Um, it's, the house is connected to PV array. 
Um, we're collecting rainwater on the roof and then putting that into a cistern so that it can be used for irrigation as well. We also looked at natural ventilation and all of the ways in which uh, we could have windows positioned in very strategic locations. So from one end of the house to the other, the air is actually gonna move through, uh, especially during the swing months. This is a really great way to, to ventilate a house. So the structure of the building that we developed with Arup, um, this is basically the, the structural diagram with all of the members that were used. And there are basically four columns in the middle. And then these are the stresses on, on all of the members. So Arup did a great job of studying all of this and making sure that all of the members that we used were the minimal sizes, um, because all of this had to be fabricated off-site and brought to the site and erected quickly. Um, same with the glass facade. So we were really trying to think about being very efficient. So this is the structure um, after it was installed. And this is the house. So from a distance, as you come around the driveway, you're passing by the pond, and the house is sort of this floating box in the distance. And as you approach the house from the parking area, uh, there are very large stone slabs that lead you up to the front door. And then the glass facade just travels all the way around. So the back side of the house um, has this uh, terrace, which is off to the left. Um, the hallway that wraps around the perimeter of the house, we wanted that to glow, and we wanted the light from the inside core spaces to glow at night. So there is a wood slat system that runs around the perimeter of the house um, where we wanted it to be private or uh, sort of screened off for water elements. For example, in the bathroom, we have a glass uh, skin inside. And in other places, like for the sleeping area for the children, it's just an open screen system, but it's slatted in a way that you still have visual privacy. So view through the corner of the house looking out towards the pond. And then a view from the inside of the house looking out. So the floor was raised up, the ceiling was lowered slightly. That was done to capture some of the infrastructure. So the radiant floor heating system below, uh, the ductwork for um, cooling and heating above. And what it also did for us was allowed us to basically disguise the lower and upper members of the frame. So as you look out, there are certain days where you don't see any reflection on the window and it feels like there's nothing there and you're just looking out at the landscape. So in this case, we, we studied the views out, and it's basically wrapping all the way around. And I think what the client appreciated was we basically thought about the landscape as the artwork in the house. So they don't really have a lot of artwork because the beauty of this place is really being able to be engaged with the landscape. Uh, the kitchen is very functional and practical. It has a tremendous amount of storage. But the key thing here is that it's a luminous white Corian, completely fused together. And because this is a weekend house for the client, um, it's something they can wipe down really easily when they have to leave. Same with the bathroom. It's completely sheathed in Corian. Um, so for us, this was a great way to use a really durable material for a family with children, really easy to keep it clean. And it's very sculptural, and it really emanates uh, light. This is a view of the master bedroom. Uh, so we did a lot of built-in furniture in this home to make it very efficient. Um, and the lighting in the um, headboard behind the bed is, is a light for reading. There are doors that swing closed from the two sides of the bed. And then the panel that you see on the left-hand side is basically a series of panels that slide all the way across. So when the client does want visual privacy from the outside, because you are in a fishbowl when you're in a glass, all glass house, um, they can really collapse the, the entire perimeter uh, and make it much more private. And this is a view from, uh, from the bed looking out to the landscape. So they have two children. Um, their children have friends. So they wanted a place where their kids could bring some friends up um, and stay over. So we did two sets of these bunk beds um, back to back. And there's a, a sliding partition that screens between them. They have one boy and one girl. Um, we designed the bunk beds so that they cantilever out from the wall. And there is a protective rail and a ladder that goes up, but it's all meant to be very minimal and clean. The slat system uh, on this part of the, or on, for this room in the house, is an open system, so the ventilation and air uh, can move through. Uh, the kids are, at the time, they were nine and 
12 or 13, so they were still in study mode. So coming up on the weekends, um, the parents did want them to focus on, on homework and things like that. So they each have a moment in their closet system where they can open up these doors and slide them back, and it basically creates a little study nook for them. Um, but while they're st sitting and studying, they always have a connection to the outside. So just to the left, they can look out uh, and see the view. So, so each child has a, a moment for that. This is the bathroom. It's completely sheathed in Corian. Um, we also designed uh, the sink as a custom Corian sink. Um, and the slat system is, is visible uh, on the other side of this glass panel. So the light can pu uh, push through uh, the glass wall. So this is a project. Um, it's in Watermill, New York, which is out in the Hamptons. Uh, so, so this project is kind of interesting because Watermill has a lot of these old cottages. And our client had this cottage and wasn't sure if they should tear it down or put an addition onto it and how that would all play out. So we actually had to study both scenarios for the client. And while tearing a house down and building a new house is a great thing to be able to do as an architect, we also realize that there's an important aspect of adaptive reuse and reclaiming existing buildings that you don't necessarily have to always tear them down. So in this case, uh, the client had a beautiful view out onto an, uh, an active farm. So we took that into account. We took into account the existing building. So this is the cottage. There's a garage next to it. And for these buildings, when we first stumbled upon them, they were somewhat unremarkable. They were not really old cottages. I think they were built like maybe in the mid 80s, meant to look very old. Um, but we thought, you know, they're, they're in perfectly fine condition. We can do something here um, that can avoid these buildings going into a landfill and still activate all the things that the client would like to do. So we looked at Joseph Cornell and looked at how he takes a collage of elements and gives them new life and also allows them to relate to each other within a framework. And we thought really carefully about how we could tell this story to the client and how we could tell the story through the architecture. So we also looked at um, sculpture and origami, thinking about folded elements and, and um, kind of iconic forms that could be kind of re reimagined, um, especially with these traditional buildings that have hipped roofs, um, you know, what can you do with, with a building that has these sort of angular forms already? How do you respond to that? So we did a series of studies for an addition onto the building and then a way to reconfigure the existing house. So there's the main house, there's the garage, and we slipped this new addition in between them. What that allowed us to do was to actually physically connect both of the old buildings, um, but create a new entry moment, create a new living room, uh, kitchen and dining space and reorient the house. So instead of the old house, which was looking out sort of towards the pool, but not really to the farm, um, instead of having that condition, which the clients felt was always a missed opportunity, we made sure that the living room is now facing this beautiful farm and the living room is also reaching out to this existing swimming pool and engaging it. So we did a series of studies and came up with a form that we felt was an undulation of the roof that was responding to the old buildings. And the result is a new living room where the structure is expressed on the inside. We used a series of steel elements uh, to do the main workhorse action of supporting the roof and had um, power beams, um, beautiful wood power beams, express the rest of the structure uh, with exposed plywood between them. And then these vaulted spaces basically created a very new identity for this house. So in the old house, they didn't have vaulted spaces like this. The, all the spaces were very flat. There was a, uh, an attic on the top floor of the, the house that didn't have any um, expression on the interior. So here was an opportunity to really take this vaulted form and express it very dramatically on the inside of this new addition, almost doing what the old house should have done but couldn't do. On the outside, we have a covered deck. Um, with these undulations, we also incorporated, incorporated these roof scuppers uh, that allowed us to drain the water in very careful ways. So when we think about architecture, we think about a lot of different components. And for us, one of those components is actually water management. So we want to make sure that the landscape is protected. So this was a great way to, to do that. And this is a view of the old house and the new house combined. So one thing we did was we stained the old house and the new house the same color, got rid of those sort of big um, graphic white 
trim pieces around the windows, um, painted that out. So we tried to think about the, this building as a sculpture in the landscape. So as the trees bloom over the course of the year, the house actually has this really beautiful relationship to that landscape and, and in, in a way amplifies the colors of the landscape. And views through the house also became very important. So leftover spaces uh, like this actually become active when you can see through them. So now the client uses all sides of his property instead of before he was really only focused on very particular parts of the property. And the connection to the pool is really improved as well. That pool used to have a giant hedgerow around it. So from the house, you didn't even see the pool. So by taking that hedgerow down and giving visual connection, uh, it allows the client to really activate these spaces throughout the year. So in the living room, we wrapped uh, the dark stained wood inside as well. Um, the client is a big reader. Uh, the wife is actually uh, a university professor. Um, so these are places where she can display her books. And with the dark color, it allows actually the books to pop out as um, iconic objects. And the ceilings are very simple materials. So basically, it's um, marine grade plywood. And it took a while to convince the client that this was going to be a good way to go. Um, you know, clients are often taking risks when you're pushing them to do something um, that they haven't seen before. Um, but luckily, they were willing to take the risk, and they really enjoy just the beauty of the natural material being expressed. And the kitchen has a connection back to the old house. And so as you step up from the new addition to the old house, we actually did a, a cleaned up sort of gut renovation of the old house as well. Um, took away a lot of the sort of tacky trim and molding that had been put there in the 80s and just gave the space back its sense of light um, and views. And even some simple details um, just by changing the stair railing, um, but keeping that quirky little octagonal window on the side, we were able to sort of do a little bit of a riff between old and new. So now we come to a project that came to us in a very interesting way. Um, so the, the project that you saw earlier, the LM Guest House, which was the all glass house, was published in the Wall Street Journal. And we continue to get really great feedback from that house. Um, so somebody calls, called me up uh, about a year after the article came out and asked if we would consider doing a project in Michigan. Um, they have a property up uh, on the peninsula north of Traverse City. They described the property to me. It sounded beautiful. Um, they had 60 acres, and they were basically subdividing it, so they would keep about uh, 15 acres for themselves. Um, they described this house as being a place for three generations, the two adults, um, their children, and then their future grandchildren. Um, they talked about how they, they live in the Detroit area. They love this area of uh, Northport. Um, and the Leelanau Peninsula, and this was going to be a really special moment for them. So they asked us about the LM Guest House, and they said, we think we want something like the LM Guest House on this site. So we said, okay, why don't we make plans to go and, and meet you out on this site? So as probably many of you know, this is the Leelanau Penin Peninsula, a beautiful area. Um, and so we waited for the client to actually come to New York and meet us and waited and waited and didn't hear from him. So I thought, you know, a lot of projects go this way. You, you don't always get all the projects that you uh, get calls for. So we sort of chalked this one up to, you know, it was nice to sort of dream about it. And then he called a week later and to my surprise said, you know, I think we're just gonna hire you. Um, we've been thinking about this a lot. We haven't been able to make it out to New York and now we're getting really antsy, we wanna start. And I said, OK, um, so what would you like to do? And they said, well, come out to the site, and we'll meet on site. Uh, bring your contract with you. I'll sign it. And we'll just get started. So this has never happened to us before. So I'm making plans to go to this area. And I think, all right, you know, I, I don't know this area at all. I need some help. So luckily, my college uh, floor mate, Diane Abrazinskis, who's from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was the maid of honor in her wedding. Um, she was my big resource. So the picture below is, is the college I went to. And uh, she 
and I had a nice long conversation and she had told me all these stories when we were in college about Traverse City, Charlevoix, the Leelanau Peninsula and all of the vacations that she and her families would take up there. So she said, you wanna to go to Traverse City, you wanna find an architect there, that's gonna be your point, uh, point of reference for, for probably all of your consultants. So she walked me through what this whole area was all about. So luckily, with that suggestion, I did my research, and I think this was the first firm that I called, Environment Architects. So I spoke to a guy named Ray Kendra, and you know what? He turned out to be a fantastic collaborator. He became our architect of record, our boots on the ground, and also a, a peer who would review our drawings, our designs, and we'd have these great conversations about the design. So, you know, I always say to people, it's better to have more really smart people around you to help you with these projects. So don't be shy about asking for help. Um, we've collaborated with a lot of architects since then in various parts of the world and various parts of the country. Um, always had great experiences. So I have to say, big shout out, Ray Kendra, class of 93, right here. So you should be proud. <laughs> um, so when we started to think about how to sort of engage with the client on this big site visit, uh, we made plans to go out to Traverse City, drive up to the site in Northport. So my husband, who's the partner in my firm, uh, was not able to go. He was actually going to stay back and look, at, look after our two children. I said to him as I'm getting ready to leave to the airport, you know, I, I hope this client's for real because if you don't hear from me in 24 hours, you should probably call the police. I'm going to this like remote part of Michigan. I don't even know if they have cell phone service there. So he looked at me and his comment was, well, thanks for taking one for the team. <laughs> so I go out to Michigan, drive up from Traverse to Northport, get to this beautiful site. And the client was there and we had this great conversation. And right off the bat, we just hit it off and, and the project started. So th this is the trip to the site. Um, there's a cherry farm on the edge of the site, and then between the cherry farm and the lake is our client's property. So he basically bought the section of land that the cherry farmer could not use for agriculture. Um, it was a heavily wooded sliver of space or sliver of property, and then you come to this cliff and it just drops off about 100 feet straight down to the beach. So I walked around the beach, I was actually amazed. I had not been to Lake Michigan before, and it was like standing on the edge of the ocean. It was so beautiful. Um, so I thought a lot about the properties of the site, all the qualities of that area, and also went to go look at the old historic fishing villages. So my friend Diane Naprzynski said, make sure you go to Sleeping Bear Dunes and make sure you go to the fishing villages. So in these fishing villages, what really caught my attention was Historically, these villages were a community of buildings that spoke to each other. And that was a very powerful message because when we go and work in different parts of the country or different parts of the world, we really try and understand what it means to be in those places and what the culture is like and what the people are like and what it means to have community there. So these buildings being a community of buildings talking to each other, and I could see that the people in these towns were also really part of this community, made me think about other communities like that. So it just so happens that we were also planning a trip uh, to Asia because the very first project that I showed you, um, the one in Singapore, we had just finished and we were going for the opening. So we made plans to stop off in Japan uh, on the way back. And these Japanese fishing villages actually have a lot of common themes to the fishing villages up on the Leelanau Peninsula. They are also a community of buildings that speak to each other. They also are incredibly tight-knit communities. And the kinds of building materials that they use are actually really relevant. So even though you're halfway around the world, it's amazing that the climate is actually very similar, the conditions of snow, rain, uh, waterfront, all of that is, is still very relevant. Um, so we looked at some of the building technology that you can find in Japan that are actually you know, centuries old and uh, looked at this method of um, burning uh, wood to create a rot-resistant, bug-resistant surface that actually ages very well and doesn't require a lot of maintenance over time. So it's a very sustainable uh, surface material. Material. It's called Shosugi Ban. Um, so we went to uh, Kyoto, we went to these Japanese fishing villages, and noticed that these buildings have been up for hundreds and hundreds of years. So initially I was a little doubtful, thinking you know, maybe this is kind of a material that is gonna deteriorate over time, but it's actually incredibly durable. So then we came back and we looked at how to do some experiments with it. 
So we found a company actually in Texas called Delta Millworks. Uh, they're producing shisugi ban, and we had them do a series of samples, and then we showed it to the client who actually was also tuned into this because he had done some research on his own. So sort of everything was aligning in a really great way to be able to potentially use this material on the project. So the other thing we looked at was program. So the program study on the left is really looking at how the program divides up into components. So the living room, kitchen, dining areas, the bedroom areas, uh, and how they can be separated, pulled apart, and then brought back together and shifted to bring light through, to make connections across these different family members. So the house is out on the bluff. Uh, as you come to it, you kind of move through the landscape. Um, and by doing this big sort of like uh, half circle rotation, the whole point was to move through the landscape before you see the house. So instead of kind of just driving up in a straight shot, we really wanted people to have a journey through. Once you get up to the house, you basically have this experience of going through layers of the house to get to the lake. So on this main floor level, uh, there is a living room, dining room connection um, separated by the kitchen. So the dining room is actually in its own sleeve, uh, which is a breezeway. Uh, that allows for the, the air to pass through, and it acts as almost like a, um, a chimney effect. Uh, so the, in the summertime, the air is really moving through, but it's also drawing air from other parts of the house. Uh, the kitchen and living room are connected, um, and they then extend out to an outdoor terrace that's covered. So there's a 20-foot cantilever on that end. And then on the other side, we have two bedroom wings. There's a master bedroom wing, which is right off the dining room. And there's a children's bedroom wing, which consists of three bedrooms. And then downstairs, there's another family room zone with a big bunk room and uh, a garage for the cars. Um, so within this layout, one of the things that was important was that uh, we wanted to zone the house so that the family could feel comfortable even if it was just the husband and wife. So the kids' wing can actually be heated and cooled separately. It has its own uh, dividing door on the hallway. So when the parents just want to be there by themselves, they're really in a smaller sleeve. But when everybody shows up at the house, the whole thing can expand and open up. So this is the view of the house. Uh, this is the 20-foot cantilevered roof, which covers the outdoor living and dining area. There's an outdoor fireplace, which is double-sided, so there's another fireplace inside. Uh, the fireplace has a core 10 surface on it. We were trying to really think about these materials that age beautifully. So the Shosugi Ban ages beautifully, the core 10 ages beautifully, so it was about this language. And also the scuppers uh, was very intentional. So the, the whole area on the peninsula here um, is subject to a tremendous amount of erosion. And over time, it's caused some very severe erosion. Uh, so we were really mindful of that. We want to protect and preserve and conserve this, this beautiful landscape. So we purposely use the house as almost like a big catch basin. So the entire roof is catching water and then diverting it to these scuppers. The scuppers are then dropping the water down into cisterns, and the cisterns are moving the water away from, from the cliffside. So view from the uh, viewing terrace looking out to the, to the lake. Oh, and also there's this tree as well, which was a, a tree that was sort of embedded in the woods. And we realized it was actually an incredibly powerful focal point. So that became one of the anchoring moments on the site for us as well. Uh, view through the house. And another view from the viewing terrace looking back towards the entry moment. So the entry moment has um, a view straight through the house, and then there's this connecting breezeway, which is also where the dining room is. And one aspect of this house is that the exterior facade is shosugi ban, but we really wanted to express this sense of chiaroscuro, the way that light passes around the house, the way that the shadows interact with the materials. So these deep battens allow for the shadows to be really expressed. So as the sun travels around the house over the course of the day, you watch the movement of the shadow across the house as well. And it's almost like a clock um, expressing time. So these two elements, which are the two um, bedroom wings, uh, one has the, um, the garage down below, are almost like little offset um, buildings that talk to each other. So this was our, our gesture to 
uh, kind of the way these old fishing villages had developed over time on the peninsula, this notion that three offset structures can actually become a community of buildings that talk to each other. The dining room um, is a connector piece that connects the master bedroom back to the kitchen and living, living room. Um, the table was actually built out of the wood from the site. So as most of you know, there's this ash borer beetle that has pretty much decimated ash trees across Michigan. And when we got to the site, the ash beetles had gotten to pretty much all of the trees on the site, but had not uh, caused the trees to just die off yet. So we talked to the client about this and I said, why don't we get an arborist out? Why don't we try and you know, protect these trees and bring them back to life? And unfortunately the arborist said, you know, this ash borer beetle is, is something we can't do anything about. These trees are going to die. So it was a very sad moment, but we said, you know, we need to do something to honor these trees. Um, so we basically um, had a local uh, lumber yard take the trees down, kiln dry them, and we used the wood throughout the house. So we wanted to make sure that the history of the place was embedded in the house, so that even if ash trees are no longer gonna be prevalent in Northern Michigan, that this family and their children and their grandchildren and all future generations would know of the ash trees in the area through the experience of the house. So the floors are the ash boards from the house, the ceiling, uh, this table was made from huge ash logs, and we used the ash for the beds, the coffee tables, the side tables, um, and even some tray elements that we had made for the client afterwards. This is a view of the living room, um, looking out to the Vista uh, viewing terrace. And the ceiling is the undulation of the structure expressed from what you see outside. So we really wanted to make sure that the structural expression was carried through and that people would understand how the house is made and really celebrate these, um, these, these big structural powerful moments in the house. And then the kitchen, uh, we stained the wood, this dark uh, kind of charcoal color to respond to the Shosugi Ban on the outside of the house. And the Shosugi Ban on the outside of the house also moves into the house and becomes part of this interior sleeve of the dining room. So it's, a, it's an opportunity to sort of take new materials and older materials, um, materials from the site and kind of bring them together. This is the master bedroom. So they have a direct view out to the lake. Um, and the bed and the side tables and the little desk in the back, those are all made from the ashwood from the site. The master bathroom. So in the bathrooms, we tried to use this uh, acid etched back painted glass tile so that it would capture the light and bounce it back and around. So the idea of this sort of vibration of light and luminosity in, in these more interior spaces was really important. Uh, the structure is expressed through all of these bathroom spaces as well. And then the connection down to the lower level. Um, this uh, has the core 10 on the inside of the house around the stairwell. But in this case, the core 10 has not rusted because it's not outside being exposed to the weather. So the client, we had this conversation about whether we should actually rust the core 10 and spray water on it. And I said, you know what, it's better if we just let it do its thing. So I'm fine if it stays this raw steel, and then you see the core 10 on the outside, it almost talks about the history of the material, where it starts and where it goes. Um, so what was really nice to play with in this project was, was this notion of how materials age and to accept that and, and to celebrate that. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. Did you guys do like a lot of all the furniture design inside that house too that was all custom or did you like bring someone else from the area to kind of do that? So we designed all the furniture and we had a wonderful furniture maker, a woodbine um, millwork and furniture out of um, Sutton's Bay. So uh, Ray Kendra was great about putting us in touch with all these fantastic artisans on the peninsula. So um, working with Woodbine, we were able to actually develop the details. And that's something that I always really enjoy as part of this process of making buildings, making places, making products, is the experience of working with people who can bring a lot of knowledge and a lot of 
uh, craftsmanship to the table. So Woodbine was actually um, you know, part of that process of, of doing the design work. So it wasn't just us actually, it was this sort of back and forth collaboration. So we had the initial concepts and then they helped us with all the little fine detailing. We talked about butterflying all these pieces of log together and uh, the grain of the wood and you know, all of the different aspects of uh, you know, how a furniture maker, maker thinks about material and then how we as architects can interpret that into these you know, statements within the house. Hi, um, so earlier in the lecture, you showed a couple of diagrams that were beautifully displaying like how simple and easy they are to read, especially like on a client perspective to know what the idea is that you guys are trying to make. So working with so many consultants, how do you still, I guess, uh, keep that graphical integrity of having simple drawings displayed to clients? Does that change during CDs? Does it still stay intact? Like what's the process? So the diagrams are really important. Um, sort of through from SD to DD and then leading into CDs. So those diagrams are actually shared with the consultants as well. And I always feel like, you know, what we do as architects is we're essentially the conductor of a very large orchestra often. So we have to basically make sure everybody's wrapping their arms around the concept and the big ideas, but then also really caring about all those fussy, nitpicky, sometimes really messy aspects of a project. So by bringing the team together and having them rally around these diagrams and often contributing ideas to them, um, you know, we, we sort of get people to, in a way, buy into the idea and, and reinforce it. Um, with the clients, we do the same thing. I mean, our process is uh, an iterative one with the clients. So we tend to bring clients in very early on in these discussions. We might show them anywhere from two to four different schemes when we're first starting off. We get their feedback and we slowly hone it into a final version. Um, we like the clients to sort of tussle with us and in the office we tussle amongst ourselves in terms of getting the best ideas to come forward. So I know there are some firms out there where they kind of do a complete package and they put one thing in front of the client and say, hey, this is it, and the client you know, hopefully likes it. Um, but in our case, we would rather the client be part of the process because at the end of the day, we want them to feel like they had some ownership in it. And we also really want to listen carefully to them because a lot of times there are things that clients will say, and it might be in just some sort of side conversation, or it might be a peripheral conversation that we're having, but sometimes they will drop little hints, and those become really important things to, to bring back into a project and check ourselves on. So, so I guess my long-winded way is to say that you know, these diagrams, while they seem simple, they're actually layered with a lot of complexity. And our job is to make sure that we can convey those diagrams in a way that allows all the different complex elements to be kind of talked about and discussed. So the, the diagram is really a vehicle for the conversation. Um, so in the second project you showed with the University Museum mm -hmm. uh, renovations, you had mentioned something about there were some Band-Aid moments that mm -hmm. were happening previously. Um, could you elaborate on those a little bit? Sure. So this is a building that um, it was designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. And it really was maybe one of their uh, kind of like B team projects or C team projects. I mean, it's not one of the ones that you would consider to be, you know, one of their, their greatest. And I think as a museum, it, it doesn't really work very well. It's, we analyze the program of the museum. The bulk of it is for storage, not so much for display. So over time, um, they've tried to manipulate parts of the museum to make it more flexible for display. So they've had to sort of, you know, um, create different kinds of wall um, configurations for artwork. Um, there's not a lot of natural light in the museum. Uh, so they've put in a couple of windows here and there. Uh, the HVAC system was a total disaster at one point. So they had to kind of really rethink that. Um, you know, for, for art, you need certain humidity conditions and temperature control conditions. So each time they've tried to make improvements, but it's never necessarily been in a full master plan mode. So we've been trying to think about the museum as, as a big master plan effort, but also looking at it architecturally. So that's why initially we thought, okay, maybe we can just do this as a renovation project. But then we realized for the amount of uh, exhibition space they need, they probably should consider an addition. So we started to develop these ideas for the addition, but doing it surgically. Because uh, again, you know, these, these kinds of buildings can easily be seen as uh, teardown buildings. 
And there is definitely an argument to tear a building down. But in this case, we're sort of thinking, well, the building itself has a certain robust quality to it. So let's see if we can make it work. And so far, it's, it's heading in the direction where with a renovation and a very surgical set of additions, um, they can get a lot more use out of it for the next 100 years. So in some of your projects, I uh, noticed that you use wood blockings as like kind of like a model. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why you guys choose to use that? And like, do you show that to like the clients or is that really for your representation for yourself to understand uh, the building? It's a little bit of both. I mean, we make a lot of models out of other materials too. So our early models are usually out of cardboard. You know, we're just like people are gluing up, you know, chipboard or they're using a, you know, foam blocks, that sort of thing. Um, I think what the wood models do is they force us to commit because wood is, you know, it's tougher to work with and, um, you know, it's just one of these things that you're making it almost like a little bit of a mini sculpture. So when you're committing to that, you, you have to feel like the ideas are really gelling. So by the time we get to the wood models, we, we really have a pretty good sense of like, okay, this form and these moves and the way the light's passing through or the way the circulation is meant to happen, it's coming together in a really meaningful way. So the wood models are, are not always um, final models. Sometimes we're doing like iterations of the wood models, but by the time we get to wood, we're feeling like we can actually lock it into place. Um, so the early models tend to be the, the messier cardboard models that get ripped apart and you know, shredded and sliced and diced. Um, and I have to say that I really appreciated walking around the studios and seeing how much model building you're doing. It doesn't happen at all schools. And I think that it's really important to feel the physical quality of the three-dimensional moments that you're trying to create. So, so keep, keep it up. All right, great. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you.